bring you come forward. Blessed assurance. Blessed. Let's pray. Oh, Lord, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to come and worship tonight. We ask you, Lord, to be with us as Daryl comes with, to us tonight and talks about the work that he's doing in the prison, which has been just a vital thing that we've supported for many years, and there's all the lives that's been touched up there, and we're thankful for that. We ask you, Lord, to watch over us, especially those that are number of having issues and illnesses and treatments and recovering from different things and we ask you always help us to be better Christians help us to be stronger help us to be more caring watch for opportunities to spread the word in Christ's name amen tonight I'll be reading Psalm 32 verses 1 through 5 Blessed is, blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man whom the Lord counts no iniquity, in whose in spirit there is no deceit. For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me, my strength was dried up as, the, as by the heat of summer. I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said I will confess my transgression transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Good evening. Good to see everybody. Thanks for coming. Um, I really appreciate, you know, the, the leadership of the church being here tonight. Oh, that's right. They all went out of town. I forgot. <laughs> I told Jody and Edwin and, uh, and Brother Yancey and Wayne that, uh, you know, I was going to call them out tonight. And I'm doing it right now. So if, if you guys are watching later, then this is your call out. So, But I appreciate you being here. It's always a, a great opportunity to be a part of the group here. Um, 
Y'all have shared in this, in this work with me since the very beginning. And I think the first, the first check I received from the congregation was in 2006. And at that, that time, Art Jackson was one of the elders, and I went and met with Art at his farm and talked to him about the work I wanted to do. He spoke to the other elders at that time and uh, invited me to come and share a little presentation I'd put together about the work that I was already doing in the prisons part-time and wanting to do full-time, my ideas of starting a transition house to work with men when they got out of prison. And it was shortly after that that y'all began to share in that. In Philippians chapter 1, uh, as Paul talks to the church at Philippi, he says in verse 3, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I, I can truly say that about this congregation is y'all have shared in this partnership in the gospel with us from this day till now. Y'all have been a part of it the whole way through. And when I say that the work that I've been able to do in the prisons um, would not be possible without y'all, that, that really is not an overstatement. Uh, so many of you, not only as a congregation, but individually have supported the work that we've done, supported uh, the transition program through uh, our nonprofit, uh, given clothes, I've got clothes to pick up tonight, countless clothes uh, that have been donated, items, uh, financial support, but encouragement. So many call or send a text or, or send me an email or write me a card. Uh, when we're down here, so many of you uh, have always been so encouraging to the men as we brought them down. And so we're going to do that tonight. I know most of you that are here look forward to hearing from the, the, some of the men that we've worked with. But I want to share one other verse with you from Psalms 137. And so the work that I'm doing in the prisons, is it doesn't change much. It's, it's pretty much uh, the same sometimes the prisons we're at. So what, what I've had an opportunity to do over the last couple of years is get more involved here at Marion Correctional. And uh, Edwin and a few of you go into Marion and do a service every Sunday. Uh, so Edwin was out of town today, so I was there this afternoon and, and preached and, and did the service there with the guys but the work at Lottie continues, the work at Marion, I'm there on Tuesdays. Greg Whipple, who's here with us, who also does full-time prison work, you've met Greg before, and, and uh, his daughter and son-in-law, Robert, uh, who came through our program. Uh, Greg's here on Wednesdays, morning and afternoon, doing classes. I'm here on Tuesdays, and then we're both trying to help support the Sunday service as, as often as we can to encourage the work that Edwin and y'all are doing there. And... But no matter what we talk about, how the work changes in working with men when they get out of prison, we still have two transition houses, one that can hold six, up to six men and the other up to three men. We've got four in one place and two in the other, and all those men are, are here tonight. You'll get to hear from some of them. But one of the a verse that's just that's been very important to me here lately as, we've, as, as I think about the work is Psalms 127 in verse 1. And I've just come to really appreciate, appreciate this passage because it's easy sometimes to get caught up in what we're doing and the logistics of it all. And sometimes the work gets very cumbersome and burdensome, just trying to take care of the needs of, of so many to keep up with everybody, to keep up with two places, to keep up with the schedule in the prisons. Sometimes that's difficult. And it, it always grounds me when I come back to these to this verse in Psalms 127 verse 1 unless the Lord builds the house those who build it labor in vain and unless the Lord watches over the city the watchman stays awake in vain I'll, I'll say that most mornings I will pray this verse before I get out of bed as I as I start my day I've just come to to learn and to appreciate that that despite everything we do, if God's not building what we're doing, if this isn't bringing glory to God, if it's not what God wants, then it's all in vain. Then we've just simply wasted our time. And Because if God doesn't watch over this work, if God doesn't watch over what we're doing in the prisons and with men getting out, if God's not behind that, if our goal is not to glorify God more than anything else, then it's really a waste of time. And we can put all the effort and all the money and all the time and all the resources into it, and if God's not behind it, the city's still going to fall. 
And so our, our, our mission and what you've helped me to do over the years is the number one is when we go into the prisons is to bring the true gospel to men in prison. And no matter what else, is to make sure that we don't dilute it, we don't change it, we don't uh, uh, twist it in any way. But let that be what we're known for in the prison system. That is just bringing the truth of the Word of God to men in prison. And that's, that's my goal. And I believe if God watches over the city, the city can't fall. And I believe that's what we've done uh, over the last 17 years or so is bring the true gospel into men in prison searching for open and honest hearts. And some of those open and honest hearts are here tonight. And what I tell the guys, and I really, I can promise you, we don't do any rehearsals for this. Uh, we just, I just tell the guys, it's just our chance to go and say thank you. That these people supported me, and they, they are, though, partners in this work. We're partners together. And as I've gone into the prisons, you went in there with me through your support and help. And I look at it as just a chance for some of these men to, to be able to be here tonight and to tell you thank you. And in all of our lives, unless God watches over the city, nothing we do will matter. If we can stay focused on that, the numbers will take care of themselves, the, the efforts, whether we're successful or not, that'll all take care of itself because we'll be doing what God wanted us to do. So the first uh, brother I want to bring up uh, I thought uh, is appropriate because Ken Hawthorne, Ken, you can come and walk on up here. Ken's only been out of prison for a week. We usually don't uh, abuse somebody that's just been out a few days like that. But Ken got out Thursday. Uh, it's actually Ken's second time through the program. Uh, he just got back uh, from uh, out of prison, and he was at Marion Correctional. And I think this is, this is a direct fruit of y'all's efforts. So I know Edwin's tried to encourage and get more people to get involved at Marion, and I want to encourage you to do the same. And Ken can attest to you and will attest to you what that meant to him. He transferred specifically to Marion because of the efforts there that y'all were doing as far as the Sunday service there. It's something that he could participate in. So he's done that. He's, we've gotten involved, myself and Greg, some because Ken was going to Marion and the work he was doing, inviting people and things. And so Ken's only been out a little bit, but I wanted to let Ken be the first one to tell y'all directly thank you for what what you've helped him in uh, as he's been at Mary in the last uh, year or so. All right, Ken. All right. And by the way, Daryl just now, about 10 minutes ago, told me that I would be the first to speak. So. <laughs> um, what Daryl said about, about Marion Correctional uh, and, and between him and Greg Whipple and uh, your own Edwin and Jody coming in. Uh, Randy Cameron, are you here tonight, Randy? Hey, Randy. He comes in every once in a while. He's been a blessing too. And, and without those guys, I don't think that that last little bit of my prison sentence would have been anything like, like what it was. It, it, it was just a a complete turnaround in my spiritual health. Um, I just, I, I felt it. I felt the love from those guys and what they bring in, the biblical teaching. And I looked forward to every Tuesday and every Wednesday and every Sunday. Not that the correctional institution would actually run properly all the time. And uh, these guys know that. They'll drive two, three hours sometimes to, to get there and the institution will be closed, but that's what they do, and they're not going to stop doing it because, because they, uh, they want to shut it down for no reason. Uh, I made a comment to some of my uh, friends that were going to the classes at Marion uh, that I'm really going to miss hanging out with Greg for four hours every week and hanging out with Daryl for two hours every week. Because those, those were, that was the, the amount of time that we were, we were able to spend with them. And now, now that I'm out, I'm not going to be able to spend that much time with these guys. Um, but it's such a blessing to have them come into the institutions. And then, of course, Daryl's program for us that, that come out, that are faithful, that, that allow the... Uh, uh, it's, it's all... Uh, the glory goes to God. Uh, 
because God's working through you and God's working through Daryl. And without you guys, without Daryl, I wouldn't be standing here. I'd probably be under a bridge somewhere. And uh, that's not being dramatic. That's, that's being real. And uh, so I thank you guys who support and continue to support the program and everything that goes on. Uh, without it, I wouldn't be where I'm at spiritually right now. This is a second, second chance for me. And uh, God is merciful. Um, I'm overwhelmed by the love of the Christians in our congregation and obviously the Christians throughout, throughout the world. And uh, I, I can't see being anywhere else. Uh, thank you, guys. So I've gotten, it took 17 years, but I've got it in here somewhere. So, you know, I'm usually up here staggering around trying to remember how long somebody's been out of prison, you know. I've wrote it down this time. It, uh, Rob was telling me it may be a sign of old age, though, that I have to write it down. But I would normally, normally get it wrong. Um, uh, I'm going to ask uh, uh, Brian to come up next. Uh, even though he showed up late, he's still going to get to speak. Um, but Brian spoke here last year, and Brian had only been out for just a few weeks, right, Brian? Yeah, that's all this Yeah, so he's just been out a year. And uh, y'all got a chance, and, and I know you don't always remember the guys from year to year, but y'all got a chance to, to see Brian. And, and Brian was just then starting that journey. And we'd worked with Brian at Lottie for about seven years, some of the longest time we've ever worked with somebody, but he had uh, hours and hours. Ken talks about the hours per week, and it is interesting that you probably do. We spend more time with those guys when they're in prison than when they get out. Uh, and Brian was engaged in so many classes with Greg, with myself, Denny Freeman, uh, Jerry, our evangelist, Jerry Crolius. Uh, we, you know, because we have Sunday services there. We have classes during the week at Lottie. And Brian, from soon after he got to Lottie, got hooked up, became a Christian, while he was at Lottie, and really set his life to go in a different direction. And so now a year, a year into it, Brian, Brian's had a very uh, up and down year in the sense of just getting his life back has been filled with great joy on a lot of occasions. Brian's son, who he hadn't seen the whole time he'd been in prison, got to come and spend a few weeks with him this summer. And so that was really cool to see to see Levi come down and uh, come over to the house and swim in the pond and, and just interface with a lot of the kids at the church and just to be around a different environment. But Levi's back with his mother now, and that's been hard for Brian. So, so it's, it's not just simply the initial thing of I've got to get my life together and get it's then bringing all these things back into your life and trying to do it in a wise, cautious way. And Brian's been good about seeking counsel. He's been good about asking. He's been good about listening to people. Uh, Clint and Samantha are here. Uh, they were here last time. Brian worked for, has worked for Clint a lot of the last year that he's been out. And so just building those relationships. And then uh, Brian just graduated from uh, truck driving school and has a CDL license and starts a new job next tomorrow, as a matter of fact, uh, doing that. But, but through all that, through all the ups and downs and, and, and the difficulties, he's maintained his focus and that is being faithful to God. And so I've appreciated that about Brian. And uh, some guys, when they get out, you have high hopes. And then you know, a lot of times they just don't work out. And Brian's not been that way. Brian's been faithful and consistent the whole time he's been out. So, Brian, come on up. Good evening, everyone. Uh, some of you I've seen some faces uh, the last time I was here. Um, back there in the back. I see a few faces over here. But uh, I think the first thing that I always like to say is thank you for your support because it was your support that has helped me and um, continues to help me and the other guys. And, and there's many challenges, you know, and as he was saying, is that development after. It's one thing to be faithful in prison because it's easy. I mean... 
to be faithful and, and follow Christ and, and know that you need him in your life. You're at the lowest rung of life and you know you need Christ. And, you, and, and, it, and it took, I was served eight and a half years and, and seven and a half of that was working with Daryl, Greg and taking many classes at Lottie CI. But um, I think the hardest part is coming out and, and readjusting and, and um, taking on all these responsibilities and trying to take on your fatherhood role and all these other things. So it's been really challenging, but um, thank God for ministries like this. And I have a place, I have men surrounded me. Um, anytime I think I need help with something, because communication, one thing I, I notice is that I like to stuff things and they don't come out unless something happens and I need to realize that and start talking about them. And so I have all those men and brothers in Christ at the church to do that with at Middleburg and uh, just surrounded by great, great men of faith. Um, as he was saying, uh, some, some highlights of this year, it's been exactly one year, some highlights were I, I got to see my son and he spent three weeks, we had a great time and I hated seeing him go. And so um, I'm working uh, towards getting him back here. So anyways, um, as he said, um, I, I went to school, got a CDL license, paid for by uh, career source and all those things. And I worked for a brother in Christ and all these things have taken place. And um, somebody asked me today, you know, all the challenges that are ahead being a convicted felon and anything. And I think the verse that keeps coming to mind is Matthew 6, 33. Is, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and then all these other things. But um, I'm not gonna take too much of your time. I really, um, it's an honor and privilege to be here and say thank you to all of you for your uh, constant support. And, I, and it comes to my mind every time where I know I'm gonna come back to these people and encourage them, let them know that, hey, you're, you're, it, there is good results because there is a lot of failures from, because not everybody makes it. But uh, that's at the, one of the things that are in the back of my mind is that, there's other brothers in Christ that are encouraged when they see results. And so it's been a year. Thank you. So Brian, Brian lives what we're, uh, we call T2 in uh, Ken, uh, uh, you'll meet Ken's roommate in a minute, but Ken lives at what we call T3. So T1, it's confusing, I know. T1 was the first place, Transition House 1, 2, and 3 is what that stands for. T1, the first place we bought, uh, Clay County two years ago changed uh, some living restrictions for certain felonies. And so suddenly, one no, uh, two years ago, November, we found out we couldn't use the place anymore to house the men coming out of prison. So kind of put us in a scramble. So we ended up uh, finding another place and, and buying it two years ago. And then uh, it had a lot of problems. Clint, Clint was one of the guys that, that helped us solve all that. He he's, uh, has his own uh, construction business, does remodeling and things like that. So we were able to do that. And then this past year, we, uh, again, with Clint's help and, and Brian and several of the guys here, uh, ended up kind of remodeling the first place that we had and, and sold it to one of Greg's and Christine's uh, sons, their oldest son, Jonathan. So uh, it's kind of neat. We're keeping it all in the family kind of a thing, you know, situation. So there, there's that logistical part of all that. And it's easy, again, to get caught up in that and lose focus on the guys. But at T2, where Brian's staying, we can hold six men and there are four men there. And all those guys are here uh, tonight. And we may, may get to hear from all of them. I hope we will. We'll just see how, how the time goes. But uh, with some of the guys, the longer they've been out, we, we don't go back and kind of tell the story again about how they came to Christ. But uh, almost without exception, all these men became Christians while they were in prison. They were seeking God. And myself or Greg or some of the other men that are, that are involved in the work uh, had a chance to sit down with them and teach them the gospel. And these men uh, accepted the truth of the gospel. And most of these men died with Christ while they were in prison. And so um, I'm going to get Sean to come up. Sean's been out for a little bit less than a year, uh, 10 months, I think. Right, Sean? Yeah. Now, now Sean's kind of shy, but that's okay. He's still going to speak anyway. Because at Lottie, Sean, Sean used to, you know, 
when, you're, when we do the service at Lottie, the men do most of the things at the service. We take turns preaching. So Sean's preached there. He's done talks for the Lord's Supper, led prayers, done announcements, led singing a couple times. Uh, we won't ask Sean to do that tonight. But uh, uh, now, 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 Sean's got some drawbacks, okay? He's from Louisiana. That's number one. Uh, he's an LSU fan. That's number two drawback. And, uh, and Sean likes to eat these little things. They call them crayfish. They look like little bugs to me. But uh, so he's in charge of all the, the crab boils and, and crawfish boils and stuff at the transition house. But Sean is a, is a quiet person. He's not going to be the guy that's out in front, but in the same way at Lottie. But every guy that ever stayed with Sean at Lottie had respect for the way he lived his life. And I think every guy that's been with him once he's been out has respect for the way Sean lives his life. Sean's not going to be the most vocal guy. He's not going to be the one standing up. Sean has, from the day he arrived at the congregation in Middleburg, became a member there after he got out, wanted to serve. And that's something we talk about a lot. Hey, you got to get out. And that's what Brian was saying. You got to get out. You got to learn to serve people. And the men that have made it, men like Robert and Clint and these other men, they've learned to serve. And that's the ticket to, to success. So, so we're always talking about what you do is you just listen for opportunities to serve, whatever, is, whatever it is. We had a brother at Middleburg. We're on a kind of like this, but not quite as heavy of a traveled road, but a pretty busy highway the church building sits off of. And so we had a brother that was doing what he called driveway evangelism, where he would just come and set up a little tent at the end of the driveway out near the road and put up some signs and just offer free Bibles, uh, Bible study DVDs, Bible studies, just things like that. And just use that as a chance as people drove by to have a chance to see if somebody's searching. And we call it driveway evangelism. So he had been out with some health problems for a while, and we didn't have anybody that was stepping up to kind of carry that on. It was, it, we did it like either every other week or once a month. And so Sean was there, and he heard about it, and he came up to me one day, and he said, hey, uh, could I do that, driveway evangelism? I'm like, sure, you could do it. So he put forth the effort of getting to know Kenny's the guy that did it before, finding out what it did, what it was all about, and started doing that on his own. That, that's just a small piece of, of that mindset of service. He always gets the communion ready, uh, helps uh, a, another brother at the service get the communion ready. Well, he just started doing that on his own. So he's not a person that you have to tell. If you ask Sean to do anything, he'll do whatever. He's, uh, he's just a good servant. He's got that kind of heart. And despite the fact that he can't help where he was born, uh, he's really a good guy. So, Sean, come on up. I'd like to apologize if you can't understand me. I've been told I need subtitles. But, uh, <laughs> but I'd just like to thank you all for the work that you all involved with. I mean, it's, it's really changing people's lives. It's changed my lives. It's, Direct me to the Lord, and that's what it's all about. I mean, you know, not very good at public speaking, but you know, I guess I could be anywhere right now, but and doing anything. But like I said I'm trying to serve the Lord, and I take it one day at a time. I come to Florida on a whim, then wind up in prison. But now, you know, I don't, I don't do things on a whim no more. I think it's in Isaiah, it says, God says, let's come, let us reason. And before I do anything, you know, I try to reason. How would this affect me? How would it affect God? How would it affect those around me? And I just try to have that mindset from, in my life. So once again, I'd like to thank y'all for the work y'all do and keep it up. It's changing people's lives. I knew he wouldn't talk very long. <laughs> uh, so what Sean did tell you is that, uh, so Sean, when he got out, wanted to pursue uh, a career in, elect in electricity. So Robert uh, had known Sean, and he knew about Robert getting involved with uh, Miller Electric, a big electrical contractor in Jacksonville. And so Sean uh, was able to get on with Miller, actually working on the same job that Robert was working on, so that was good. So they would see each other every day. Uh, I think the two of them get, get up early in the morning sometime and go to the gym together, those kind of things. But Sean just got accepted into the apprenticeship program with Miller Electric, too. So Robert's going into third year right now, Robert. Fourth year. 
fourth year apprenticeship and Sean starting uh, what will be his first year. So uh, again, uh, all that kind of ties together. Uh, you see in prison as you go in, is it you just, it's just so sad because it's such a waste of talent. And men that, that, that have ability, you don't go in there and say, man, no wonder these guys are in prison. They don't have any abilities at all. You don't see that. You meet guys like Sean and Brian and, and Ken, and you see guys that have tremendous ability, but their lives have gotten off track because their character has overwhelmed their physical abilities. And so what God does is a chance to bring their character into line with Him, their holiness in the line with, with our Father in Heaven, which allows these characteristics that he'd, some of these He'd given them from birth begin to shine. And we never, I tell guys all the time, because guys are always concerned about their job when they get out. And what I tell guys all the time is, you won't go back to prison because of your job. You won't go back because you couldn't find a job or couldn't make enough money. You will go back because your bad character overwhelms your job skills. And that's, we've just seen that, I'll dare say, in almost every situation as we've worked with men. And so it's no wonder that these men become very successful once they get their lives together. They, they are able to complete schooling and do things that sometimes they'd never done in their life before and challenge themselves in a way they've never been challenged. And it's because God changing who they are. And that we, we still live in a nation that, that if, if you can keep your life together, you can be successful really pretty easily. There are opportunities everywhere. And so these men have simply uh, just taken advantage of those opportunities. I'm going to shift gears a little bit. I'm going to ask Ray to come up. Ray's been here a bunch of times, and I usually don't make Ray speak, but I thought this time it would be nice for him to say hi. Ray's been out for 12 years. In three days, Ray has been out for 12 years. And uh, Ray's about uh, as different than uh, Sean as you can get. Ray grew up in the streets and down in Fort Myers. And, uh, uh, but Ray's, Ray has been so very successful in his life. Uh, one time you get Ray aside, you can talk to him and ask him about how many times he's been shot. Uh, and we, you have those conversations and it just makes you realize as Ray talks and he hangs out with us and we're around him, you just sometimes forget just how different that life was for a lot of these men. Uh, and so now to see Ray and to see where he's at in his life. So I just wanted to come up and have a chance to again let you know where he's at and tell you thanks. Let me see. Let me see where to start from. Um, <clears throat> well, I just want to thank thank everybody for for what they do because I stand here now because of what y'all did, you know. And it's very, I'm just very humble for that because I see the other guys get out. It's the same thing, you know. They want to change their life. They want to do better. And the best thing about that, there, when you come to your senses to do what's right. It's going to happen because, you know, you think about the particle sun, you know, it doesn't matter what people said, you know, what they say. Hey, man, you need to straighten your life out, you know, and all this here. If you don't make your mind up to do what's right, you ain't going to do it. In the story of the particle sun, he, he came to his mindset that he wanted to do what's right. He remembered what the father had for him and he remembered what, what was good back then, you know. I can relate to that there, but I didn't have, like, I didn't have the like the partical sun, but it was the dark side I had first, you know? And then to be invited into the light, and I seen that, that was great for me, you know? And that's what I needed because before I came to the light, I was looking for something, but I didn't know what it was. I was searching. And it was just a humble experience because when I found it, I actually held on to it. And I wanted more of that, you know? And it was good for me because I knew who I was, but I didn't know who I was, you know? And that's, it's, it's mind boggling because when you know who you, who you are and then who you can be, it's a big difference, you know? Now your knees don't shake when you speak and stuff, you know? And all this, you know, all this stuff here, you can stand up and speak to people and everything. And it's a great feeling for me because the more I read the Bible and learn about who I am in Christ, it makes me, you know, it, I get bigger. Or something like that. I guess I do, I get bigger, you know. But still, 
I just want to thank you all for what you've done and what you have did. And for the men that's coming out and for the men that's still in there, I'm pretty sure they're searching too, you know. And they want to they want, they want taste of what's, what's, what's good on the outside, you know. It's not all about being locked up because locked up, you can only go so far, you know, from here to there. But when you get out, you can go from here to yonder, you know. And it's just, it's not just the sky. Sky is just not the limit. It's something beyond the sky, you know. So I think that we need to say, um, if sky is the limit, now sky is just, it's just right there. There's something above the sky that we can get, that we can reach, and that's heaven. So I just want to thank y'all and appreciate everything you've done for us and everybody else. Thank you. All right. Uh, I'm going to have um, Chris come up, uh, Larson. Come on, Chris. I didn't tell him he was going to speak either. I just find it's easier. Then they don't get all nervous. <laughs> and it's just better that way. <laughs> but uh, Ken, Ken brought up that it was his second chance at grace. And Chris is the same way. So both Ken and Chris, and I think this is, this is something that's important to, to note is that you know, several of the guys, the, the change that comes from, like Brian said, being a Christian in prison and then living it out here is, is startling. And I didn't see that at first in the work. I saw men that changed in prison, and I just naturally assumed that that would just carry on. And the reality is, the longer you work with men in both situations, the more you see, like they said, in what Ray said, you can only go so far in prison. There's, there's a truth to that, that Many men can stay focused, can stay clean and sober in prison, but it's much harder when they get out. And so I think with, both with Ken and Chris, you know, they, they, they were faithful in prison, very dedicated the first time they got out with, with the right intentions. The right intentions was get out and serve God. And then they both in different ways just got swept back up into the world. And so you can underestimate when you're in there and you've changed your life, you can underestimate what the world's going to be like. And it's awkward, right? You've never lived this kind of life before. You've never, you've never uh, uh, gotten the idea of I'm going to be integrated into a spiritual family. How does all that work? There's just so many things that, that I've been able to see that growing, I grew up in the pew. So it was just, it, those things are just natural to me. I grew up that way. And, but for many of these men, it's not that way at all. And so to, to see the challenges of going out and seeing them fail and then going back in, sometimes you see so much God's grace in that they get disciplined very hard and very quickly after they've fallen. That's the best thing that can happen. The men that are going to change the next time are men that were not allowed to go on for years and years and years and years back in the world and not seeing the consequences of that, that life. That, that, that's, that's God's mercy is when they get disciplined. And I think that's been true with, with Ken and Chris. They've got different outlooks. And, and, and look, Ken's only been out for a few days. Chris has been out for what, four months, Chris? Something like that. So look, there's still, there's still a lot of life to live. But I think what the program is designed is not you get one chance and then you never get to come back. I, I tell... Every guy that, that we work with, if you, if you go back and if you relapse and you go through a treatment program or whatever, we'll bring you back. If you go back to prison, you'll have the same opportunity you did before. All I ask is that you show you repent it, you show you want to change, you show you're willing to learn from the mistakes you've made. And so, so what we've started to see in the program is we've been doing it long enough now where we've had some men come back through the second time, and some of those men, uh, not all come through the program, but men that we've worked with that have been successful. And so I'm certainly uh, expecting that of Ken and Chris, and uh, it'll, be, it'll be interesting to see as, as we work with men that fell again, but now have had another outlook, another chance to come out, and now they see, a, a, they, they see the mistakes they made before. Are they willing to submit to God in those areas of their life? All right, Chris. Good evening. Yeah, I, I want to thank all of you, too. First and foremost, you know, my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and, and all of you for giving me and a lot of the other guys here the chance to get our lives back. So 
to touch on what Daryl said, two points that he made. Number one is, yeah, I failed the first time because I felt that I had it. I felt I was good. I, I felt, okay, I got a good job. I got a good career. But like Daryl said, it's not the job or the career that's going to even make you. It's, it's just remaining faithful. But see, I, I've been dealing with a, a cycle like I kind of just wanted to talk about, for me, is breaking the cycle, the cycle of apostasy of alcoholism. And I came from an alcoholic home and an abusive alcoholic home. You know, my dad raised me, trained me in alcoholism to perfection. I had my first beer at six years old, my first alcohol poisoning episode at 13. And really for 40 years, I've just been wandering in this desert you know, living this life that that's okay, I can drink and live a normal life. Well, you just can't, and eventually it catches up, you know, and, and it really did, you know, harshly for me. I mean, I lost a lot. My family, loved ones, people dying, lost everything. And, you know, when I failed that first time, I mean, it was just devastating for me because I just didn't think it could happen, but it did. And like Daryl said, maybe it was for the best that it happened, it, that it had to happen. Because God could have let it go on for years. I could have, you know, skated through, but he felt it was necessary to punish me quickly. And this second stint in prison, really, it was a short one, but it was really one of the hardest ones. It's gotten worse there. It's not better, it's worse. It was probably really the hardest 10 months or that I'd done in prison, and I've already served almost seven years in prison the first time. So really for me is, is I've got to break this cycle of apostasy and alcoholism. And, you know, something I just want to read is that when we come to God with our lives shattered, whether by others, by the wrongdoing, by our own, God takes our broken hearts and makes us new. Second Corinthians 5.17 says, If anyone is in Christ... The old is gone, the new is here. So it's Christ's love and life that he gives us that breaks the cycles of our past. And that's something that I really just have to focus on. You know, I'm doing the best I can, as best as I can, but I can't guarantee anything. I don't think anything, any of us can, but this program and Daryl's love and, and all the brothers in Christ and sisters in Christ, that the love that they've shared to me, that's what gives me hope, you know, and Jesus Christ is that hope. There, Without that, there is no hope. So I just, you know, I want to thank all of you from the bottom of my heart for supporting Daryl and the ministry and giving all of us men a chance to, you know, hopefully get our lives back and stay on the right track. I appreciate it. Thank you very much, folks. Good job, bro. Good passage. Okay, so I, I'm just trying to give you, it's, it's always you know, hard, we don't have time for everybody to come up, but trying to give you just kind of a, a blending of the different men and the different situations. And of course, everybody's unique and everybody's an individual, but there's a commonality to all of us, and that is this problem, this problem with sin. I'm, I'm going to ask uh, uh, Marcus to come up. Now, Marcus is really interesting in that Marcus has never been to prison. So you're like, well, how did he end up at the transition house? So that's an interesting story. But, and I'll just, and Marcus can talk about it more, but the, the cool thing about Mark, Mark, Marcus's brother is a gospel preacher up in Boston right now. And uh, uh, Curtis, uh, the way I knew uh, Curtis is through my, my sons where they worship at Vestavia Hills in Birmingham. And so Curtis and his wife, Emily, were members there. And so they had interfaced, heard about the prison work, and they'd visited Middleburg before because they had his family. They were from Jacksonville originally. And so uh, Curtis's story is cool is that he went on a baseball scholarship, right, Marcus, to Florida College. Got a baseball scholarship to Florida College, not associated with the church at all. Got down there and was taught the gospel and became a Christian. And then consequently... At a later point in time, his parents became Christians, which is Marcus's parents. And then Marcus ended up moving to Birmingham because that's where Curtis was, and there was a job opportunity there. And Marcus 
was taught the gospel and became a Christian. And then his life got off track. And, and he can talk about that on whatever level he wants to. But, but anyway, he ended up back coming to Middleburg because his brother said he might get connected with us and we might give him some help. And so uh, Marcus showed up one Sunday, we talked, and then after he came and visited the transition house to one of our classes, and then after talking with him a little bit, just said, hey, you, you, you need this program. You need to be in a situation where you're going to get some accountability, where you can uh, get around some of the right kind of people. And that's been, what, a little over a year ago, Marcus? Has it been a year? Nine months. Nine months ago that Marcus came to stay with us, has been faithful. But again, it just shows by having the program, having the transition house, uh, there are opportunities for men that have never been to prison. But if Marcus didn't change his life, he was heading there. And so it's, it's kind of nice to be able to intervene on some level. And we've, we've had other men over the years. Uh, one that comes to my mind is uh, Clinton Yancey. We, tried, we worked with Clinton for a while before he'd ever gone to prison. And have not always been successful, but to have a chance to intervene, and, and Marcus has done, has done very well, and um, so we'll let Marcus come up and talk to y'all. It was, it's been very helpful for me. Like Daryl said, I uh, did become a Christian in uh, Birmingham, um, got engaged to a woman, and uh, she was cheating on me. And um, I didn't really know how to handle that, so I just picked up everything and, and moved back to Jacksonville. Um, went right back down the drain, got right back on uh, drugs. And, uh, and uh, yeah, Daryl's right. So my brother, even before I, I came back, when he knew I was moving back, he had told me, uh, you need you need to visit Middleburg, and uh, he said there's a man named Daryl Towns in there. I know him from the Stavia, and I know they do things right there. And um, it uh, it took me about ten months of uh, living back in Jackson before I actually made it. Uh, and I was actually you know I went there uh, three or four weeks. It was four weeks actually, and then I I ended up relapsing and uh, missed a Sunday. And Daryl Daryl texted me and. And I, you know, I told him that I'd relapse and he, he wanted to meet with me and he, and we did. And that's when he told me that, you know, he thought the best thing for me to do is, is to be there. And, uh, you know, I wasn't in prison. I was a free man. So to go to a program, you know, that has a curfew being held accountable, you know, it's something I, I didn't want to do. And, uh, after seeking some good counsel, I, uh, I realized that that was what I needed to do. And, uh, it's, it's been, it's been so it's been so awesome for me because, um, so I, I left everything, went to Middleburg. Clint Williams actually gave me a job. So I'm working with a brother in Christ. He has other workers there that are brothers in Christ. Um, I end up getting a, another job. One of our deacons owns a pest control company. So there I'm working with brothers in Christ. And, uh, and then when I get off work, I get to come home to brothers in Christ and we all struggle with similar addictions, and we all have the same goal, which is everlasting life in heaven. And uh, so we're always there to, you know, encourage each other and keep us on the right track. And I'm so thankful for that uh, because I, when I was in Jacksonville, even though I wanted to do right, I was too weak. And so uh, this has been a, a game changer for me, and I'm very thankful for that. Um, you know, it's, it's not all uh, cake and ice cream. You know, we, we have differences as men, as you can imagine, four and five men living in the same household, sometimes don't know each other very well. Uh, but at the end of the day, we, we handle it responsibly because, you know, we love each other because we're, we're brothers in Christ. And uh, I'm sure they all feel the same way. And uh, thank, thank you all again. Um, you all really are, are making a difference. Uh, praise Jehovah. Thanks, bro. I'm nervous that I said. I'm nervous that I said. <laughs> You're right. So the the brother that uh, Marcus works for, uh, Aaron Wallstrom, uh, Robert used to work for him, and, and several of the guys, uh, Neil used to work for him, and uh, so between Clint and Aaron, a lot of the guys that come through our program ended up end up working for them, off and on or at some point. 
But Aaron puts together a men's trip every year for the guys the last, I don't know, five or six, seven years. And we use it as a chance uh, kind of out of this program of authentic manhood that I teach in the prisons that we've gone through to call young men up. So when they're 13, they're invited for the first time. We do a little ceremony, give them some gifts, and we call them up. And then when they go off to college, we do a ceremony for that. And it's gotten to be a tradition. It's really a lot of fun. Well, this is the first year that the guys at the transition house, I've had the kind of men in the situation with such with probation and everything that, that the guys could go. So all the guys, all the guys went. Well, you know, so we're, you know, so we stay at this, this bed and breakfast place or, you know, this house we rent for a couple of days. And you can understand there was 30 of us there, 30 guys. And uh, so that was fun. That was cool. Did a devotional every morning, every night. Then we, the, the, on the Saturday, the last day, we check, kind of check out, and then we go on a canoeing trip usually. So we're on this canoeing trip. Well, this was most of those guys. Marcus was there, Chris, Brian, uh, Sean, uh, their first time. So, so Marcus has a bad shoulder. And, and, but that's okay because we, we've done, we did CrossFit together, you know, a few times, and, and we, we try to hurt Marcus's shoulder, but he, he kept it in place. It, it separates all the time. So we're going canoeing, and, and you know, as men kind of do, uh, and Clint was especially bad about this, and Brian, very bad examples for the rest of the men, trying to tump everybody's canoe over. Well, you know, some of these guys, like me, think they're younger than they are. So Marcus decides he's going to go after because they tumped his canoe over, so if you can't do anything, you try to tump them over too, so at least you can be in misery together. So he reaches up to tump the canoe over, and he separates his shoulder right there on the, on the river. So, you know, we're a bunch of loving guys, right? So we pull over, and this is so funny. Literally, they're like, pull up YouTube and see how to put in a separated shoulder. So we're out here on this river, and they're standing up on the bank of the woods. The rest of us are parked around the canoes, and, and I'll be honest, we were laughing our heads off, but we acted like we were concerned. So Marcus is screaming, and I won't make the yell, but you, you'll never forget it if you heard it. He's screaming in agony. He has to swim out. Everybody's trying to help him. So a couple of guys do. They pull it up on YouTube. Marcus can usually get it in by himself, but it took him a long time. So, so finally, he pops his shoulder back in. So then what do we do? Well, we keep going on our trip. We're not going to stop because a guy separated his shoulder and got it put back in. So we go, and then Sean has to paddle Marcus the whole way back. And so uh, that, those are the kind of memories that bond men together. You guys will understand that, right? Uh, Brian, you have your hand up for some reason? Oh, Airbnb. What did I say? Bed and breakfast? Yeah, that doesn't sound good, does it? Yeah. So, so but Marcus will be forever known as the guy who, who screamed on the river. And so the rest of the river, being the compassionate men we are, we mocked him the whole way back. So in unison, there was, you know, eight or nine canoes. Somebody would start screaming, and then the next canoe would scream, and the next one would scream all the way down the river for the next three hours. So that was a lot of fun. All right, uh, Arnell, Arnell's going to come up. Now, Arnell's the youngster of the group. I think Arnell's 33. Is that right, Arnell? You're 33? 33, so he's the youngster in the group. Uh, now, Robert, when he was at the house, was 26, I think, right? 25, yeah. So when you're in your 30s or early 30s, typically in the transition house, you're one of the youngest guys. So uh, I met Arnell, and this is, again, a unique situation. Dale Davenport, let me kind of, I'll circle back to Arnell. But y'all had all these books y'all were wanting to get rid of. So Jody had a bunch, and y'all had a bunch here at the church. So Dale Davenport's a guy that's been out for two years. Dale's a big book guy. Uh, likes to trade them, you know, and stuff, but just he, he's an avid reader, especially books written by brethren and stuff like that. So, so when uh, y'all contacted me about, would you know anybody that want the books? Dale wanted those books. So I made four or five trips whenever I'd be here on Tuesday at Mary and I'd swing by, get a trunk load and then take them back to Dale. And so Dale is a guy that, that it was at Liberty Correctional and some of you may know Tommy Peeler down, used to be down in Tampa. He's now, I think, in, in Indiana or somewhere, but a preacher. But Tommy had worked with Dale in the county jail. Dale was already a Christian when he went to jail and, and eventually went to prison. Tommy contacted me after Dale had been in for a while and said, I've got this guy, Dale Davenport. He's at Liberty Correctional, which is out past Tallahassee. So it's about a, about a three-hour drive from my house. And so I began to, to go see Dale, write and correspond with him. Dale was avid at teaching the gospel to men. 
And Arnell was one of the guys that Dale had taught the gospel to. And there's probably 10 or 15 men that over the next few years that Dale would bring to me or teach himself that became Christians. And so now uh, I go there about once every four to six weeks and do one-on-one visits with these men, study with some of them. But we do a worship service there once a month. Uh, Myself and uh, a brother named John Haley, which is up in uh, Dothan, Alabama. But Arnell was a product of that. And we've had two or three guys now come out of that. And so it's, it's a long way away. We can't be as involved as we are, say, at Marion or at Lottie. But, but again, because somebody like Dale was there and doing a lot of the teaching and helping, it brought somebody like Arnell along. And then Arnell wanted to be told, told us, you know, got, I got to know Arnell. We started talking about what are your plans when you get out and those kind of things. Arnell, Arnell came from a background of being in the foster system a lot when he was growing up. So he recognized it, at his age that he needed some structure. And so that's why Arnell came to the program. And uh, I'll just tell you, Arnell's one of the best guys I've ever had that will ask before he does anything. And, and sometimes I get a little irritated with him. I'm like, come on, bro, why are you asking me that? Of course it's okay. And he's smiling because he knows it's true. Even though I act like I'm not irritated, I am irritated. Uh, but it is a strength of his and that he doesn't want to, he's, he's like Ray a lot in that area. Ray, we're going to put on Ray's tombstone, light versus darkness. Ray's always seen that clearly. And Arnell sees the right path and he's, he's very concerned that he's going to get off that path. So he's always wanting to know, Hey, is this the right thing to do? Is this, is this okay? He's not a guy that's trying to go out on his own and chart new territory. He's got a humble spirit about him in that way. And he will always talk and ask about things. And when he doesn't like something, he'll humbly approach it. And I've appreciated that about Arnell. Again, you can only know a man so well when he's in prison. So since Arnell's gotten out, we've, I've gotten to know him and all the men. He's, he's, Arnell will shake hands with everybody at the church when he's there. Uh, he's super friendly. He always has a, He's got an infectious smile. So it's uh, been a real blessing to have in the program. Arnell's, Arnell's been out now for about four months. It seems longer than that. But uh, he's got a job with a, a steel company there outside of Middleburg. We were able to get him a job the first week he was out. And he's doing very well there. So come on up, Arnell, and give you a chance to talk to everybody. Good evening. Um, foremost, I would want to thank you guys for... Um, supporting Daryl's ministry. Um, I don't know where I would be um, <laughs> um, if I didn't come to the program. Um, I really appreciate what you guys do um, for the ministry. Um, I'm a little shy, so. <laughs> um, uh, like you said, you know, I, I come from a background of the foster care, so I, I moved around a lot when I was younger. I got adopted when I was 16. Um, my family, my adopted family wasn't the best family. Um, got myself in a little bit of trouble uh, with the mother of my child. Um, went to prison for 11 years. Um, just recently got out in April. And I'm, I'm basically trying to live my, right, live my life according to how the Bible tells me um, to live. Um, I met Dell in 2014, so he's the one that really, like, Daryl said he introduced me to to Christ, um, and he's been a great help to me since I've gotten out, um, supporting me, um, and just basically talking to me about the Bible and trying to do the right things. And I'm very kind of like scared in the sense to um, do the wrong thing, so I'm always asking questions, like Daryl said, a little paranoid at times. But but again, I just want to thank you guys for what you do. Thank you. The scariest part about Arnell is he didn't have a driver's license when he got out and didn't have a lot of experience driving. So, you know, uh, here I am sitting in the car. We're, we're going up to Walmart here a few months ago and uh, practicing uh, parking in a parking lot. <laughs> and it, it flashed back memories of me teaching my daughter how to drive. And that was a traumatic experience in my life. So uh, the courage you have to do in this work sometimes is in different ways than you would you would normally think. But Arnell got his driver's license, so he he can drive now and 
But Dale, talking about being a servant, Dale, who, who because of health reasons, is not able to work anymore. He's, uh, he's old enough to collect Social Security, but he's got some military benefits that he's going to be getting too. Uh, but anyway, he volunteered to drive Arnell back and forth to work uh, every day, which that was going to fall on to me if Dale couldn't do it. Because we always say, look, you find the job, we'll figure out a way to get it done. And Dale was able to do that, and, and boy, what a help that was. And it really gave Arnell and Dale a chance to kind of get reacquainted, because Dale had been out for almost two years by the time Arnell had gotten out. Uh, but, but Dale's willingness to serve. And, and I'll, again, reiterate that the guys that are successful are guys that, that serve. Uh, you know, Neil's here. Neil, Neil, I looked you up. I forgot how long you'd been out, too. Neil's been out eight years. And Neil's had that, that attribute about him where he was always willing to help. A lot of times new guys come to the house, Neil wants to take them to lunch. Uh, that mindset to serve. Uh, Clint and Samantha, raise your hand, Clint. Clint was here last year and spoke with his wife, Samantha. They've got three beautiful children. Clint's been out 10 years, I think, right, Clint? 10 years. Uh, again, I didn't work with Clint at all. He worked with Carlton McPeak. And just in the last two or three years, kind of we've, gotten to know each other. Clinton wanted to get involved with the men uh, at the transition house. So he started attending the classes. He's cleared now, it to go, has been cleared for a while to go in as a volunteer. He preaches at Lottie usually every month, uh, goes to Lancaster from time to time, uh, works with a brother of their LJC Elkus that's doing a service at Lancaster. Uh, again, serving others. And, and, and Robert down here in Katy, y'all have seen Robert through the years. You want to stand up, Robert, and show him the baby? So Robert and Katie just had their second baby. And so uh, it's funny, Greg and Christine never used to come when it was just Robert or Robert and Katie. But now that they have grandkids, they come every time now. I don't know anything about it. <laughs> but uh, just uh, Robert's a godly example of service, man. He, he just wants to serve. And uh, Robert, Robert's been out for, again, I have to check my list, seven years. So there is a commonality. Men that get out and stop seeing themselves as keep serving me is to now I can serve others are the men that in the long run make it. Uh, Ken, Ken has a lot of AC experience, so he got to serve right away because the air conditioning went out at T2 the day Ken got out of prison. So he's already repaired the air conditioner since he's been out. So we appreciate uh, that service. But so many of the guys do things uh, th to help others. Uh, I, you know, Rob's back here. Uh, Rob's a member at the, the congregation in Newberry. Rob, how long have you been out now? Seven years. Well, Rob worked for another guy that had come through the program, Mark Donnelly, uh, and did all the repair work on T2 when we first bought it and live there by himself with it being kind of half finished, you know, uh, through all that. Rob used to, used to work for Miller Electric when he was up in our area. And, and Mike and Brenda, who are members at Newberry, have in the past been very involved with the prison work too, coming into the prisons with us. So I, you haven't got to meet everybody, our, time, our time's up, but I just want to give you a flavor for that. And, and just, again, just say thank you because... Um, when these men, these men come up and say thank you, it's not because they're being, they're being forced to do this on some level. It's because the men that really have their minds right really understand that I'm just the guy they see. And I, and I try to emphasize this over and over and over is, is when, when we, uh, you know, Ken got out the other day and we bought him some clothes and a phone. Uh, we just had to get a, another computer for one of the transition houses. And, and, and guys will say thank you to me and, and they understand, but it's not my money. It's y'all's money. Y'all provide those, those opportunities. When I bring a guy a Bible or buy a book uh, for him to read and study or whatever it is, or, you know, I put gas in my tank, uh, it's, it's y'all's money. And I can promise you, I don't lose sight of that fact. And, and we're just so appreciative of your generosity and your caring about about men that many people think it's a waste of time, even among our brotherhood, to go in. We've got, we've got people that won't attend Middleburg because of the men that we work with are there. And that's, that's sad. That's, this is the essence of serving Christ. It's the essence of what we've been called to do uh, in the kingdom.
uh, as a way of invitation, we looked at, at Psalms 120 and 123 earlier, to, I'm sorry, 127 earlier today. Well, in my Bible on the opposite page is Psalms 130. And I just want to read, read one verse. And that is in verse three of Psalms 130 he says, if you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? Most of us haven't had our sins posted on the internet. Some of these men have. But we all know if God marked our iniquities, if we just want to put a chart up of everybody in here and all of our sins, which of us could stand up and say, yep, I'm a good guy? None of us could. If the Lord would mark our iniquities, who could stand? Verse 4, but with you there is forgiveness that you may be feared. And if you don't know Christ, then you stand with your sins written in the book of heaven. And who can stand? Who can stand? But God's offering forgiveness. He's offered that to us. He's offered that to these men you see. He's offered that to all of us. All we have to do is step out and recognize who He is. Fear Him. Fear His power. Fear what it will be like to be separated from Him in eternity. But experience and feel His love. Because He does not want to hold those sins against you. He wants to save you. And if your mind is right, you've thought about that, and you're, 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 you're undecided, study with somebody here. Jed will study with you. There are other people here who will study with you. Open up your Word. Let God's Word penetrate your heart. But if you know what you need to do and you've just delayed it, then tonight's a good night to do that. Tonight's a good night to have your sins taken away, to die with Christ. You can do that tonight as we stand and sing. Thank you, Daryl, for being with us again. It's just uh, such a wonderful time we have together to, to uh, hear about the good things that are going on in your area. So uh, we're just so happy for that. And uh, all the men and a uh, few wives as well, we're glad you're here with us again. Uh, you men are an inspiration to us. You really are. You can change your lives in that way. We just pray that uh, that change will continue on. And uh, we wish all the best for you. I have just a few announcements. Uh, remember our sick, especially uh, remember uh, seven-year-old Sawyer and uh, 11-year-old Abby that we've mentioned, friends of the congregation that uh, are uh, being treated for cancers at this time. So as well as all of the other folks we have on our prayer list, please remember them. Remember Wednesday night, summer series, name above all names, uh, Brother Jerry Crolius. I think I heard that name earlier will be here, and he'll be speaking about Jesus, the Apostle and High Priest. 
Also remember, we placed uh, Jody's name before the congregation to be a shepherd in this congregation. So uh, please, uh, again, he's not here today, but uh, when you have a chance, talk to him. Talk to the elders about that. Uh, the Lord's Supper is prepared for those unable to take of it earlier today over here in room 8 and 9. So you can go there as we sing our closing song, and then we'll be dismissed in prayer. When upon... You know, when I emailed uh, Brother Townsend earlier, earlier this month, one of the things he asked for was just prayers for wisdom. Um, and I th think that's a wise request. Hope it's something that we ask for on a daily basis as well. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are grateful for the men who are here tonight. We're grateful for the change that you represent in their lives. Father, we pray that, that as we assess our, ourselves and the individuals that we are, we know that consequences can vary for, or for our actions. Father, some are very visible, some are uh, you know, non-existent or invisible at all to us right now. Father, we pray that, that we have the wisdom to make the kind of change that they have chosen to make in their lives, whether the consequences of our own actions are visible or whether they are invisible. Father, we pray for wisdom in the choices that we make. We pray for your guidance in all